I'm sure some, if not all of you, are familiar with the Flying Tigers, at least visually, if not by name, although their name is fairly famous as well. And how could you not be? They have one of the most recognizable paint schemes in all of modern warfare. I would argue that if you mention anywhere really in the world the P-40 Warhawk, the image that pops into your mind is of the Flying Tigers Warhawks in World War II. Now, there's a lot of confusion, especially today, about whether the Flying Tigers actually flew the P-40B model. Some say it was the C. Others claim it was the Tomahawk Mark IIs. But here on the, the model box, it says it's a Curtis Hawk 81A2. So which one is it? Join me as we dive into the history of the P-40 Warhawk on this episode of Building History. Welcome aboard to the inaugural episode of Building History. Here, we're going to build a model, and then as we go through it, we're going to talk about the history of the actual machine, the men, the women that actually flew and fought in these amazing airplanes. Hopefully, I will be able to, to give you a couple of ideas here and there, maybe a few things that'll That'll spur some, uh, something from you guys if you are, are new to the hobby. And maybe some of you that, are, that have been here for a long time. I'm getting back into the hobby after a 13-year hiatus. So I, I'm really not the greatest builder, painter, weatherer in the world um, by any means. And so what I was hoping for with these videos is really a dive, even if it's just a surface-level dive, into the history of the machines because that's what's really interesting to me when I build these models. I love learning about the history. It's not just putting together the plastic and painting it to make it look real. I, I like researching it and understanding what these people went through when they went to battle in these amazing machines. And I, I love learning about all the, the interconnectedness of it that when you just kind of briefly read through history, you just don't get. It's not to say that this is going to be an um, exhaustive history of, of these things. It's not by any means. It's very, very short. But my hope for these videos is to get you excited, to get you to look at these machines, these things in a different way and have a deeper understanding. Even if you don't understand it all, that's fine. I sure don't. I'm always learning new stuff all the time. So today... What we're going to be building is the Airfix 172nd scale Hawk 81A2. That's what it says here on the box in the markings of Charles or Chuck Older, who served in the American Volunteer Group, famously the Flying Tigers, back in 1942. Like I said before, this is my return to the hobby kit after about 13 years of not modeling. So, what I'm using this kit for me. Building wise is more for practice and experimentation as I'm using new techniques. I'm trying new techniques, I should say. I'm trying out new products, especially in this one you're going to see. I'm using the Vallejo model line. I have never used this paint before. I wanted to give it a try. You know, right now, 172nd scale is a little small for me. I'm, us I'm usually a, a 148 scale guy. That's what I'm comfortable with. So a lot of things are really small here, especially a lot of the details that I'm working on. As I said before, it's definitely more of a practice kit for me, a kit to break in back into the model, into the modeling hobby since I've been out of it for so long before I start tackling some of the kits that I really, really like and uh, and screw them up uh, too badly. Plus, I love the P-40. It's one. Of, it has always been one of my favorite airplanes, especially World War II. I think it gets a bad rap. Don't think it's nearly as bad as some people think it was. And arguably, it is the best looking airplane i don't care what you p-51 lovers say it's one of the it's got to be the best looking airplane of world war ii although the corsair is pretty close the kit looks really nice right out of side of the box although the panel lines and maybe this is an airfix thing i've kind of heard this is kind of true and the panel lines do look really really deep uh, especially in the 172nd scale where did the p-40 really come from well just like chicken wings Buffalo, New York, specifically here, the Curtis factory, 
all of their airplanes starting from the 1920s they called Hawks. And this is kind of the beginnings of our naming confusion that's going to travel with us all the way through the end of the P-40 Warhawk line. The lineage of the P-40 really starts with the Hawk 75, or as the military called it during the time, the P-36 Hawk. Curtis, who at the time to save money, but really not all on their own, this was at the behest of the uh, U.S. military. They slapped a 1,150 horsepower Allison engine onto a rebuilt H-75 Hawk prototype. This first flew in 1937, and the company then designated it the XP-37. It had a lot of quote-unquote issues with the turbo supercharger, namely it caught on fire. Not the best thing to happen on an airplane. Adding to that, the cockpit had to be moved so far aft to balance out and make room for that massive turbo supercharger. That forward visibility was almost non-existent. And you can see that in this picture here. Look how far back that cockpit actually is. It makes it look like a racing airplane. Curtis was never one to give up easily, however, so they tried it again, this time with a mechanically driven supercharger. And this had the uh, double effect of reducing its operating altitude, but it increased its engine reliability, and the cockpit did not have to be moved. They named this model the 81, and it was designated the XP-40, which had its first flight in October 14th, 1938. Now it's starting to look more like the P-40 they were used to. However, you'll note that the original prototype had the radiator on the belly, looking much like the P-51 did later in the war. It was promised at this time to do 360 miles per hour, but at first it was incapable of doing so. Further testing and experimentation moved that radiator incrementally forward until it got up to the nose, which gave the P-40 its distinctive shape and finally delivered the 366 miles per hour at 15,000 feet. And we're starting to have an airplane that looks like what we're used to seeing the P-40. The XP-40 then at this time went on to beat the XP-38, which became the Lightning the XP-39 Air Cobra, the AP-4, which turned into the predecessor of the P-47, as well as two other of Curtis's own designs, and was awarded a military contract for 524 aircraft on April 26, 1939, for a price of $24,566.60. Don't forget that each. In 2021, the year I'm recording this, that's equivalent to $460,000. $356 a piece. Moving that radar up to the nose made a very capable airplane that could withstand an immense punishment and still bring those airplanes back to the field. The cooling lines and the radiator specifically being very, very vulnerable to, to, um, to incoming fire. Anytime, if one of those lines was severed for any reason, the engine quits. So having them all up in the nose Give the effect of having a very, very small target. Whereas on the P-51s, not to say the P-51 was more vulnerable, not necessarily it was, but it extended from the nose or to the belly. Anywhere a bullet got in there, it could potentially sever one of those lines and affect the reliability of that engine. So all these design effects, besides giving us a great looking streamlined airplane, especially these early P-40s, the so-called small-mouthed P-40s, the one with the small radiator intake. Starting from the E on, that radiator intake became a lot bigger, and I think it changes the look a little bit. I like the early looks a lot better. It's just something so streamlined, so mean-looking about these early small-mouthed P-40s that I just can't get over. I like how, I love how they look. They look so good. After finishing up the dry brushing and the white, I'm using a toothpick here with red and picking out some of the small details, little switches and knobs, add some visual interest to the cockpit. Now it's so small and everything is so cramped in there that you're really not going to see a lot of this stuff. And so I'm trying some new techniques here. Like here, as you see me mixing up a lighter shade of the interior color, mixing up some of that interior green with a little bit of white, and then painting it on in some of the highlight areas to get some tonal variation. A little bit of contrast, a little bit more contrast, especially after I add the wash a little bit later. And it's going to be, like with the switches and knobs, just really, really hard to see just because it's so small and so tight. But what a better, is there really a better time to practice a lot of this stuff than on something that you're not going to see really at the end. So if you are thinking about doing some of these techniques like I am, practicing some of these techniques, doing it on these interior sections, 
that you're not going to see is a great place to try it out, see how they work, and understand how they work for next time. Now I'm adding the a black oil wash. I did add, I did make my own oil wash using a Windsor & Newton ivory black mixed with some mineral spirits. I am flowing that on. It flowed really nicely in all, to the, all the crevices of the interior cockpit. And again, adding that contrast, adding that drama, if you want to say that, if you want to use that word for it. Visual interest, visual contrast. Once you put that pilot figure in, especially if you do put that pilot figure in in this one, with as small as it's going to be, it's going to be really, unless you got a pin light in there, it's going to be really hard to see anything going on. At this time, I figured out I actually had made a mistake, and I was supposed to paint half this instrument panel black, and I'd done it all in interior green, so I'm fixing it up here, hand-painting on the Vallejo model color, and then these, these paints actually brush paint very, very well. Very easy to brush paint, and they flow, and they settle down nicely, and even out kind of on their own. Where I did have trouble with them was when I was airbrushing them, even thinning them down. They, I had a lot of trouble airbrushing them. I think I just need to get more practice doing it, understand a little bit more how they're made up, I should say. I'm trying to do a lot of the work here initially on the sprues as much as I can. I'm doing a lot of the work on the sprues, a lot of the painting on the sprues, a lot of the priming on the sprues, just so it's easier to hold. I've said it about three times already. A lot of this stuff not going to be able, to, you're not going to have seen, so I can just work on those edges that get cut off anyway, and it's all going to be glued in. You're not going to see it. Finally clipping them off the sprues, cleaning up some of this flash, and dry fitting everything, dry fitting the cockpit into the fuselage of the airplane. Now the instrument panel on this airplane is a decal, and I really generally don't like it. I don't like the decal for instrument panels. I'd rather paint them. As tedious as it is, I think it, it looks better, looks a lot more realistic. But this is the only option. It was a completely smooth piece for the decal. Here I'm putting that on using Mr. Mark Setter and Mr. Mark Softer. For the final bit of the interior assembly, trying out another new technique is an oil filtering method. I'm using some titanium white, burnt umber, and ivory black. And I'm putting those on using kind of a dot filtering, oil, oil dot filtering technique on the interior. Something I've read about, but I haven't tried. Again, just trying new things, see how they work. It worked out reasonably well. I just don't think I have enough practice with it. Using the cardboard here to leach out a lot of the oils so that they dry faster when you put them on the, on the, uh, on the model itself. But it does add a little bit of a weathering, a fading, and a staining of the interior sub-assemblies. Doesn't get picked up really on the, on the camera here, but up close you can tell a, uh, a bit of a difference in how, uh, in how those look. Final assembly of the cockpit area being glued in. I'm going to call that a wrap on part one of the P-40 build. Next episode, we're going to get it all assembled and ready for paint, as well as continuing our dive into the history of the actual airplane. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for part two of the P-40 on building history.